Welcome back. An episode of Critiquing Creationism. And we're going to pay some attention to plants. Plants get short shrifted in the whole young earth creationist discussion. We're just always interested in the sexy animals, the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, the elephants, whales, right? What about plants? How did they fit into this big picture? Now, I saw this picture the other day. I've, I've seen this image several times of Puya ramandii, the largest bromeliad here on the left side, right? That's a heck of a pineapple, right? Pineapples are a type of bromeliad. One one of the 3,700 species in this family is the one that makes the pineapple that you and I are familiar with. But many of the bromeliads make a large flowering stalk called an inflorescence that uh, is similar to what, a, what makes a pineapple, right? The flowers of the pineapple eventually become fruits that become an aggregate fruit, um, compact. You're actually eating many, 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 many different fruits from different flowers that all become an aggregate together into one, what you think of as one fruit of the pineapple. Um, here you can see this flowering stalk here, you can see obviously the individual flowers. And when they produce fruits, those fruits won't sort of fuse together to form the pineapple structure, but yet there'll be little small fruits in each for each one of those flowers that then birds and so forth will come uh, pull out and eat and fly away and then deposit at the seat somewhere else. All right, but, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going we're gonna to learn a little botany as we're going through uh, our little lesson about bromeliads. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to just go and learn something about bromeliads, and we're going to address a couple questions. So let me just give you the rundown on um, the big questions. We're going to address the question of biogeography, all right, and flood geology. So that, that, that asks the question, what is the distribution of, the, of this family? And how would flood geology, the idea that the world was covered by a, a global flood that created the geological column, including all the fossils, and somehow bromeliads um, survived that flood? And then how do they, why are they where they're found today? How would the flood explain that versus a conventional explanation for the origin of bromeliads and their particular location on earth, their habitat? Right, so that's the first thing. Then we're going to look at the, well, we're going to talk about all these things at the same time, but we're going to talk about the origins, right? How many kinds of bromeliads are there? Is the bromeliaceae a family, which for animals, now for, for animals like the canines, right? The caninidae, the, that family is considered one kind of organism that God created at the beginning in the seven days. Uh, and all the diversity within that is, uh, has uh, come from that original created kind. The cats, all right, uh, rats and mice, and you, know, there's, you can go through and look at a bunch of different different kinds of, of animals. What about plants? What's the equivalent in plants? I'll just tell you up front that uh, there's much less discussion among young earth creationists about plants and what constitutes a kind, but there are a few people that have looked at a few different groups of plants and they generally come to the same kind of agreement that those things that taxonomists have identified as families of plants um, they would also consider probably something like a kind that God potentially created just one type of, let's say in this case, a bromeliad. And that bromeliad then had diversity, all right, genetic diversity, which allowed it to diversify or speciate into many, many, many different species of bromeliads. In this case, 3,700 known species of bromeliads. Um, but it, potentially there could have been many, many different types of bromeliads that, bromeliads that, that God created as separate kinds of something that was similar to each other. Kind of like there's a bunch of different kinds of carnivores, right? There's cats and there's or felines and there's canines and there's bears and there's weasels. And all right, you know, there's like 12 different kinds of carnivores. Bromeliads could be that way. Maybe there's multiple different kinds of bromeliads that are original created kinds. That's going to make a difference in our discussion of the biogeography and the flood geology. 
because if there's 10 different bromeliad kinds, then how did they all survive the flood? And as I'm going to show you, how do they all end up in the same place on earth? Why aren't they distributed? Why aren't bromeliads distributed across the whole earth, or at least across the entire tropical regions of the earth? Because they, that's their mostly specialized tropical habitats. Uh, but in fact, they're only found in South America and Central America. They're new world plants, not found in the old world, with one exception, which we'll have to deal with. Um, so they're, they're new world plants. Interesting, right? That's an interesting observation that begs for an explanation. So we'll talk about the explanation for that uh, in the two different models of creationism and sort of the conventional uh, history. And then we need to maybe discuss a little bit about speciation rate. If there's 3,700 different types of bromeliads uh, that originated from a single original type of bromeliad, that's a lot of speciation that has occurred. And young earth creationists, um, if they believe that all bromeliads are one kind, then that fits with this whole accelerated or rapid speciation that they have to propose, just like they have for animals. Right. So those are the those are the three big areas, um, along with a complete lack of a fossil record. There's no evidence of bromeliads in the flood geological column. So that's an interesting observation as well. All right. So. Those things are things that we're going to take a little deeper look at as we just explore some facts about bromeliads and talk about bromeliads. So we're going to learn a little botany along the way uh, and then just kind of weave in the sort of the critique of young earth creationism as we go. I don't know exactly how this is going to go. I'm, we're just going to go to Wikipedia. We're going to start learning some things about bromeliads. We'll just sort of take it from there and see what happens. All right, let's get started. All right, so here we are. I said we just kind of like, let's just start with some basic information about bromeliads. So if you're not familiar with what a bromeliad is, here's a, here's a, a good place to find a general description. And there we see our pineapple, right? That's one single species of the 3,700 species of bromeliads is the pineapple. That's Ananus uh, camosus. Um, but it has some a lot of the major characteristics of pineapples and that is i mentioned before it has an inflorescence so that's be like a stalk that has many many different flowers on it and in this case each of the flowers becomes a fruit and i don't know if you can see it here but each one of these little uh, hexagons right here would have been an individual flower so big white flowers on the stalk and then each one of those flowers develops into a fruit and the fruits in this particular case kind of fuse together so i know when you when you um cut a pineapple open right and you have the core of it that you don't eat well that's sort of that's the original stalk that the flowers were around right the ovaries or the uh, the, ov the ovaries and ovules uh, of the flowers uh, surrounding that and then when you look at the pineapple you, you might actually see there's kind of like sections of it right as you go around the circle and that is each individual flower so you have multiple different fruits that are all fused together that's called an aggregate fruit um, and so not every bromeliad has this particular feature, obviously, but they have similar features and you see the types of, uh, leaves these have. These are typical. So monocots, lots of monocots have like long strap like leaves and they have like uh, veins that run parallel down the leaves, like grasses do and uh, palm trees do and other things, uh, versus like an oak leaf, which I might have like one main, uh, vein and then it kind of splits off from there right and then kind of the veins kind of come out from those central cores uh, but they're not in parallel lines so look at your orchids look at your lilies uh, those monocots they all almost almost all have parallel what's called parallel venation uh, and you can kind of see it in this picture here uh, in the case of bromeliads many bromeliads have very very tough uh, leaves completely very impalatable to most organisms and they're living in places that are going to have a lot of potential uh, herbivory. Most bromeliads produce a, um, uh, take silica from their environment and they make these little tiny bodies inside of their cells, all right, of various shapes. Uh, and so essentially they have little pieces of glass and they're usually in their uh, epithelial cells, right? The outer cells, their skin of the, of the plant. 
and that makes them rather impalatable to very small organisms that might try to chew on them. Um, and so they're not the only type of plant that does this. It's a fairly common feature. A lot of the grasses are this way as well. Um, but nonetheless, it makes their leaves very, very tough. Uh, it makes them, it makes, it also gives them a lot of strength. So they're called, uh, actually the technical term is phytoliths, uh, that are, uh, they impregnate the, uh, the cell walls, uh, of these plants. Um, and so what do we have here? We've got, uh, I showed you that picture of this extremely large one, right? You know, this more than 10 feet tall. And that one, and the interesting feature of that one is, and really almost all the bromeliads, uh, or let's just say a large portion of the bromeliads have a life cycle that consists of, um, you know, being a vegetative plant, meaning not being mature, being going into reproduction and just staying vegetative for long periods of time. Uh, and then at some point they mature. Usually that means they've gathered enough photosynthetic material that they have enough energy that now they're going to spend all their energy making a flower, actually hundreds of flowers in order to reproduce. Uh, and they produce this one terminal stalk. All right. So at the very top of the plant, because most of these plants just have one stem, right? They're not branching. Uh, almost very few of the bromeliads actually branch very much. Uh, and so they might have one stalk. And then at the end of that stalk, eventually it turns into the flowering stalk. And then once that flowering stalk is done, right, produces its hundreds of flowers. The nice thing about bromeliads and a reason that a lot of them are cultivated and they're sold in stores is that, um, once they begin to flower, uh, their flowers can last like 30 to 90 days, right? They flower for a long period of time and the leaves, uh, of bromeliads will get very colorful, right? Right before they start to flower. But the problem is once they flower, the plant is done. They put all their energy into the flowering, take all the energy from the rest of the plant that they've stored up in the leaves and then send it into the flowers and eventually into the fruits that they're going to make. Right. And so they're making the next generation and then they pretty much expire. So those huge, that huge one I showed you. Um, yeah, let, actually, let's go take a look at that. Right. So here we go. That huge plant right there. Um, this, the life cycle of that thing is about a hundred years, right? So it's going to live for some hundred years of it as a vegetative plant. So most bromeliads are very slow growing. Um, uh, many of them are epiphytes growing up in trees and, uh, we have a whole bunch in our greenhouse. I water them all the time. Lots of the, lots of bromeliads have a, uh, have leaves that have sort of cups, uh, or at least the way the leaves are arranged, they'll collect water and then hold them in the leaves. Uh, and so uh, there's lots of different organisms that live inside of bromeliads. There's actually a special, uh, there's a particular species of frog that lives in one particular species of bromeliad, right? So they're, they're, they're each, the bromeliad, the, the frog is very specialized to that particular bromeliad. Um, which indicates probably a long period of time of adaptation for that, that frog to become completely adapted to that particular species of bromeliad and not any other species of bromeliad happens to live in an area where there's like dozens of bromeliad, uh, in that particular area, but that frog will only live, uh, or coexist in, with one particular bromeliad. All right. Well, anyway, back to Puya, uh, which grows in the upper Andes. So at high elevation. Uh, this is a one that's lived somewhere between 75 and maybe 150 years before it then throws up this massive flowering stalk, right? With thousands of flowers on it. And then once it reproduces and produces its fruits, it's done, right? So the next generation is going to have to be generated from the, the fruits of this particular plant. What else, what other basic things do I want to say about bromeliads before we get going here? Oh, I think it's uh, a really important thing to know is the distribution. Let's bring up this little map right here. Hmm. Now that's an interesting thing. Where do you find 3,700 different species of bromeliads in the new world? Now they're mostly tropically adapted, but they also live in high elevations. And there are some that are adapted to extreme de desert environments. Right. So they have adapted themselves to multiple different environments. We have very, very large ones. The smallest one I didn't show you, but most of you are familiar with the smallest one and it's Spanish moss. 
right? Little, little tiny leaves, and you've probably never seen the flowers on Spanish moss, even though a lot of them may actually be in flower. They're just a, like a millimeter in diameter, right? Tiny, tiny, tiny little white specks um, are the flowers of Spanish moss. So Spanish moss is not a moss. It is a bromeliad. Um, they're both monocots in terms of, a, of their larger grouping, but uh, mosses, actually they're not both monocots. What am I talking about? Moss is a bryophyte, which is a non-vascular plant. It doesn't have vascular tissue, meaning it doesn't have xylem and phloem for moving uh, nutrients around uh, in photosynthesis and water inside the plant. Whereas bromeliads have, um, that Spanish moss, um, has those uh, characters, anatomical characteristics. Uh, back to this particular map, right? So these plants have adapted themselves, different species have adapted to virtually every type of climate in South America and Central America. Don't those climates exist in Africa and in India and in Southeast Asia and Australia? Absolutely. There's no reason why bromeliads can't live in all those different locations. I'm sure that if you brought bromeliads from one from there, uh, and, well, I'm sure that people grow bromeliads all over the world, right? And they're growing them here. You know, we have them in our greenhouse here in Ohio. Um, now, most of the ones we have are tropical. They're not going to do well if I just punt them outside. However, there are plenty of climates where bromeliads can naturally grow on the earth, and yet they're not found there. So that's an, that's an observation we make of the world. They're not found other than in the new world. Now, I do have to point out, because you're probably going to see it here, there's a little tiny green dot in Guyana right here. Uh, and there's a local, there's a small area in Guyana on sandstone cliffs, a relatively dry environment, sort of like a, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's one of those environments where it's like semi-tropical. There's like a lot, there's a rainy season and there's a dry season, right? And that takes special adaptions for plants to live in an environment like that. So there's a bromeliad that kind of, that kind of hangs down uh, on the side of these cliffs. Um, and that's the only species of the 3,700 that is known to grow outside of the new world. And you wonder, how did it get there? How did it get there? Um, those who have done the studies of the, have done the genetics and looked at the relationships or the similarities of the genes, the sequences of these plants for each other, say that this particular species is a species in a genus for which there are multiple species of that same genus in, in uh, South America. Um, and it's quite similar genetically to a few of those other species. And so by being a couple, being a species from a genus for which there's other species on another continent tells you the fact that they were put in the same genus means they're very similar organisms. They have, they're very similar genetically. Um, and so that has raised the, the possibility, actually the, the main hypothesis is that this is an individual that was brought all the way from South America to Africa. Now that's a long trip, um, but it's known to have happened um, in other organisms. Uh, and the way this would happen would, I mean, a bird has eaten a bromeliad. And so the gut contents of that have the seeds in it and the bird flies. And we know that birds can fly across, you know, from South America to Africa. Generally, they're going north to south. They don't generally go that direction as much, but there are a few birds that make tremendous flights uh, across these continents. All right. And then poops out the seeds at the, uh, you know, when it lands and voila, you know, bromeliad uh, starts to grow there. Uh, the other possibility is it just, you know, it gets, the, the fruit gets stuck to a bird's foot or is on its, in its feathers. Some kind of small seed is in its feathers. Some of these bromeliads produce very small seeds. And it gets transported by a lucky accident across the ocean and begins to grow there. Now, it's not the same species, so that indicates it's not something that just happened yesterday or 10 years ago or 100 years ago or probably even, even thousands of years ago. This could be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and that species has now derived, or that particular population, which was the same as the species in South America, has derived enough genetic differences 
over time and living in a different environment has adapted to a very different environment in that particular location in Africa that has become its own separate species. Right, so now let's just think about this. Now let's let's come back to the young earth creationist thing. And the idea, the, the concept of how did plants survive the flood? So this does the reason people don't talk about this so much is because young earth creationists, it's a little easier for them to explain plants. You know, like to explain cats and dogs and bears. Well, those are things that every single one of them wiped off the face of the earth. And the only ones that survived were on Noah's Ark. And so when they see dogs on every continent or bears in different places, they have to explain them as having come from a pair of bears that walked off the ark and then distributed themselves, right? Dispersed across the earth and came to locations where they are. Like, why are koalas only in Australia? Well, they had to have come from the ark. So they had to have dispersed, traveled all the way to Australia. And that's what everyone loves to talk about her all the different kinds of you know, dilemmas that are created for young earth creationists uh, by animals. Plants don't seem quite as difficult because creationists will just say, look, you know, there were all these different kinds of plants before the flood. And then the flood comes along and kind of mixes everything up and tons of plant debris is floating on the surface of the earth. And some of those plants were, you know, uprooted. So some of them were like pieces of plants um, that still have roots. And when the flood was done and the waters receded, some of those pieces of plants got, you know, were just mixed in with the mud and they just started to grow, right? They just uh, hung out in the waters for six to nine months and managed to survive that. And so chunks of these plants would have just been distributed all over the earth and started to grow in various places. Or the seeds survived, right? They produced some fruits. And those fruits are just floating in the in the flood and then the flood recedes and then fruits, fruits get scattered around. They break open, the seeds break open and they begin to grow. Okay, great. That's how you could have a whole bunch of different plants. In fact, you could have a hundred species of bromeliads that had existed prior to the flood or a thousand species of bromeliads could have been around prior to the beginning of the flood. And then those thousand species all survived the flood. And that's why there's a thousand. Well, now there's 3,700 species of bromeliads um, because they continue to speciate and become different species over time in new habitats after the flood. Right. That seems simple until you look at something like this. And this is actually true for lots of different plant groups, lots of different plant families. Um, I don't believe I've made a video yet about cacti, but I'll, I'll do that one. It's kind of a similar story. Um, uh, because cacti are a new world plant family, and there's well over a thousand different species of cactuses in the cactaceae, and they're only found in the new world. They're only found in the new world. So, so what's the problem? If there were hundreds of species of bromeliads that had existed prior to the flood, and then let's say even only 10% of them survived, like there's a thousand and 10% survived. That's a hundred. That's a hundred different species of bromeliads that survived the flood. Where did they survive? Well, apparently they only survived. They only ended up surviving just in this area in the new world. Why not somewhere else? I mean, the flood is, is especially for young earth creationists who say that the original world was a single continent before the flood. So those plants were uh, in a tropical area, probably tropical area in that original continent. And then the whole world's rocks got, uh, sediments got uprooted, and all those plants got uprooted. And many of them are epiphytes possibly hanging on trees, right? And those trees get ripped up and they're floating around. How come they all just sort of fell out and got, ended up only growing in the new world? That's a weird distribution. Now, they might look at that one in Africa and go like, oops, see, one of them landed in Africa. The thing is, the African one is so similar to the South American ones. Um, it seems to just be a branch off of one genus, which is sort of a latecomer. You know, it's a, it's a relatively advanced type of bromeliad. It seems like a post-flood bromeliad. If we were talking about animals, we certainly would be talking about it being a very recent uh, origin of that. So weird distribution, 
yeah, let's let's go let's go to this paper for a moment. I think I can I think I can pick out a few things here. Uh, phylogeny, adaptive radiation, historical biogeography of the Bromeliaceae inferred from NDHF sequence data. So just one particular gene looking at the sequence information from that. This is 2007. Uh, and if we skip down here, uh, they looked at a whole bunch of different species. Uh, yeah, okay, so here's the Bromeliaceae. And all these different names here are different genera with different species. Uh, here's Puya ramandia. That's the, the that, that huge one. It's uh, some 15 feet tall. Uh, here's Tilienza. So this is the um, this is Spanish moss. And here it is. Pitcarnia feliciana. That's the bromeliad that's found in Africa, that particular species. But you see there's a, several other species of Pitcarnia right here. And then the branch links on this phylogeny, this relationship tree, based on the DNA sequences. You see how these branches are, are quite short, right? All these are very similar to one of these different species are similar to one of each other. And all of these species are found in the New World, and really everything else here is found in the New World. And so all of these constitute the Bromeliaceae. They have a lot of morphological features that are similar to one another. And genetically, you can see that they're all quite similar to each other compared to other plants, because we look at other families. There are two other families of plants that are genetically most similar to the Bromeliaceae, and that's the Typhaceae and the Spargatus, Sparganaceae. I don't know this. I don't know Sparganium. Um, and then we have uh, down here is Poaceae. Those are the grasses, right? Uh, so these are all various forms of monocots. And, you know, they have genetic variation, but they're contained within groups and so forth. And that's where we get our family distinctions from. And then within those groups are genera, which are more similar to one another. And then if we break out, then down here a little bit farther, we're breaking out all the different types of bromeliads. And the bromeliads have been divided into subfamilies. And so like the Puyoide. Uh, is a subfamily of the Bromeliaceae, and so it includes the genus Puya, which is kind of fairly distinctive, and so it's sort of been separated out. Uh, and so here's your Pitcamoidae, uh, and that includes uh, Pitcarnia, uh, which as I said before, here's your Pit, here's your Pitcarnia feliciana. And down here, I just wanted to note that uh, this is the molecular this is the molecular clock thing where they're looking at how much genetic variation accumulates over time. And then estimating the divergence time of these different species. So if we say like at some point there was a common ancestor of all bromeliads, the original bromeliad type, um, and that then diversified into all the diversity of bromeliads today. Uh, and what they found is that all the, the oldest lineages of bromeliads are essentially tropical oriented. So I think it's, it's more of a, of a tropical adapted plant originally that then sort of figured out how to get out of the tropics and move into higher elevations and deserts um, over time. But note the ages here. This is only goes back some 20 million years. So this is a relatively recent family compared to other flowering plant families. Flowering plants are as old as maybe 150 million years. Um, but, and a lot of the major groups of flowering plants go back to 65 million years and a little bit older. So they go back to the time of the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Um, but bromeliads are relatively recent, uh, newcomers. In other words, they've adapted fairly quickly, um, to, and well, I'll say speciated fairly quickly to produce 3,700 species in just the space of maybe 20 million years. Now, what's significant about that is, right, so if we go back to our map and we think about how conventional biologists would explain the distribution of bromeliads, this fits, in other words, the molecular data that estimates that all those different bromeliads could have evolved from a common ancestor maybe 20 to 30 million years ago. Um, now, the common ancestor of bromeliads in Typhaceae go back maybe a hundred million years. So they're, they're, they're a very old group. And there's, uh, I read there's a whole bunch of disputed fossils that are from 50 and 60 million years that could be bromeliads. Um, but you know, they're kind of 
you know, it's kind of questionable <laughs> there that the types of leaves and things you find, they don't have the flowers, which would be the, like the most important part to identify them. Uh, and so we don't know, but there might be, uh, there might be lineages of bromeliads that existed for long periods of time, but one particular lineage then is responsible then for dividing and diversifying into all the modern living bromeliads we have today. And so what we're saying is the the living bromeliads, the 37 art species we have today, have a relatively recent ancestry. Uh, and since this is where they're found, right, those living ones, that ancestry is easily explained as only existing in the, the new world because the new world had, already, had split off, especially South America, uh, split off from the old world well before 30 million years ago. And so this continent is separated. So whatever the, whatever the ancestor is that was on that particular continent as it rafted away from the old world, right? That particular ancestor then adapted to South America, diversified in South America, but because it's surrounded by water and eventually formed a connection, right? Five to seven million years ago to North America, spread into North America. All right. But, you know, they're hard to escape North America because they have to go far north where they're really not adapted to, to extreme cold in order to escape over to Siberia. And so the only single incident we know of, of this particular plant group as it's adapting, speciating, populating a continent, it's only escape that we know of is to one particular place in Africa. So that's explained by vicariates biogeography, that these plants have been isolated on that continent. So now for young earth creationists, you know, if they're going to say that, um, I, I guess they could say that maybe God created a type of bromeliad in the original creation. The garden had a bromeliad. That bromeliad maybe was not very, um, uh, very populous, right? There weren't a lot of individuals and there weren't a lot of species. And so maybe 1500 years later at the time of the flood, maybe there's only a few bromeliads. And so maybe only one or two of them survived. And then those couple survivors just happened by chance, because if you only had two survivors, there's a good chance they both end up on the same continent, right? They both end up in South America. And then they begin to grow and they form a population. That population then grows and expands and begins to adapt to the local climates and becomes epiphytes and large shrubs and goes into deserts and forms these different kinds of desert adapted plants and so forth. And then some will grow in very high elevation. Some become very long lived. Many bromeliads have long lives. Um, so I mentioned the one that has a hundred year lifespan, but there's lots of them that are like in the 50 to, to 80 years. Um, and then doing that thing where that's it, they reproduce and die. Um, now your, your bromeliads you might buy in the store. Um, usually they're a couple years old and they're kind of like to the point where they're pretty close to flowering. Cause of course that's what people want to see are the flowers and the colorful leaves that are produced. Um, and so they're only going to survive for another couple of years because once again, once they flower, they're kind of, it's hard to keep them going. But nonetheless, a large number of these 3,700 species have long lifespans. And so I mentioned that because let's go back to the creationists potential creation hypothesis, creationist hypothesis, and that is that there's just a couple of bromeliads that survived the flood. They happened to be in South America. And then those two bromeliads became all 3,700 species. Not that different than the creationist explanation for something like finches, right? There was two finches or maybe seven finches on the ark. They fly off the ark and now there's 1,500 different species of finches in the world. And if you can leave the extinct ones, there's probably well over 2000 uh, different finches. And they say that they're all part of the same kind, right? One kind. So they've all diversified. They've all speciated from a central point from Noah's Ark. So maybe bromeliads are the same way. And then one bromeliad happened to get to Africa. So it ends up being the same, the same story and the same, and, and it has all the same problems that their animal explanations have, which is you have to have extremely rapid speciation. And that's why I mentioned the lifespan of some of these organisms, right? These high elevation, very large bodied 
um, bromeliads that live for a hundred years before they reproduce. And so they don't reproduce for a hundred years, reproduce. Um, in order for them to adapt to that environment, right? It's going to take many, 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 many generations. I would say thousands of generations in order for them to gradually adapt to that particular uh, uh, location. Uh, and then for them to have many different species, those species have to have isolated genetic variation and have their own unique mutations and so forth uh, in order to become identifiable as different species, even living in the same area. In order to do that, the population genetics of that suggests that that's going to take hundreds of thousands of years to do. Young Earth creationists only have a few thousand years to work with. And if you have a long lived organism, it's like the same problem that you have with uh, elephants and making a hundred different elephant species after they walk off the ark. Um, since, it's, since the generation time is so long, although elephants don't even, I mean, they can have offspring after 15 years. Right, so that's not an incredibly long lifespan, even though the elephant itself might live longer. These plants have really long lifespans when you consider they're not going to reproduce for 50 years. Um, and so that makes the speciation process much, much more challenging than even many of the animal examples. So it's this biogeographic distribution that is the big serious challenge to the young earth creationist model. So either they have to have very few bromeliads existing prior to the flood or surviving the flood. And then you have massive amounts of, of, of radiation, right? Adaptive radiation into, into habitats and the production of many, many different species. Or you'd have to say, maybe God created lots of different types of bromeliads. But then statistically, how how do you explain all of those bromeliads just only happen to survive on the continent of South America? Right? How do they know, like when they're floating around the entire earth as the water is rushing back and forth over these continents, that they all needed to gather together and just live on uh, South America? So, you know, I think that's probably enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit about bromeliads. Um, maybe I didn't really say enough to convince you that all the bromeliads are similar enough that most creationists, and I, I did a bunch of searches to find out, like, what have young earth creationists said about bromeliads? And the answer is uh, nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like, other than just sort of like, pineapples are cool and, you know, uh, you know, bromeliads are, are, are neat organisms. I haven't seen anyone that's written about bromeliads and like explained bromeliads within the young earth creationist paradigm. Uh, so I am just speculating here as to what young earth creationists could do. All right. They have like, I think the two options are they're one kind. And if they're one kind, uh, then the question is how they survive the flood and then how do they diversify into a great extent only in the new world and not in the old world. Uh, if there are multiple kinds, how do they all end up in the new world and not have like a few kinds end up in the new world and a few kinds end up in the old world? And then how did they get to be so diverse in such a short period of time when many of them have very long lifespans? So they have long life cycles. That leaves very few opportunities for natural selection to work. Right, which is why the, yeah, the, the conventional uh, opinion about these is that, uh, that actually bromeliads are very fast speciators. They've speciated into 3,700 species in the mere amount of 20 million years, potentially. As short as 20 million years. And that is amazing to evolutionary biologists. Um, that's considered a, a quite a, a astounding rate of speciation. But... Young Earth creationists are going to have to compress that into just a thousand years or so. Considering many bromeliads clearly have been around as the species they are for a long period of time, like this particular one in this picture here, um, which has definitely been around for thousands of years uh, in this very same form, especially since you can find uh, 
you know, dead versions of these things that are probably thousands of years old that are still preserved because they're at very high elevations in the Andes. All right, so, so where did that come from? How did that plant become the type of plant it is so quickly? Um, the other thing I didn't point out was that uh, the fossil record is, let's just say it's scant at best. Um, very, very few bromeliad fossils. Um, I said there's some really old material that's 50, 60 million years old, but it's disputed as to whether it's a bromeliad or not because it's, you know, strap like leaves. And I mean, there's lots of monocots that have those similar types of leaves. Of all the modern species, there's very few uh, fossils. Now, part of this is because they're found in South America. Most of that region is tropical. The fossil record isn't so hot for most of that region. And these types of plants aren't going to preserve well in those particular types of environments. So that's not too surprising. But for flood geologists, right, for young earth creationists, if there was lots of bromeliads around before the flood, right, if there were epiphyte bromeliads, if there were large sort of yucca type bromeliads like this particular one you see here, and those had existed and were living at the time of the onset of the flood, they would have gotten captured in the flood. They have these very tough leaves, right, with these silica uh, bodies in them. Right? There, there, there aren't hardly any organisms that are willing to eat a bromeliad. Right? It's kind of like eating a fern or eating a pine tree. Right? They're tough stuff. Um, that's going to be captured, should be captured in the flood rocks quite readily. Uh, and we should find whole chunks of bromeliads that are preserved for us. And yet we don't. Um, and so that's a missing element that I would say young earth creationists should predict should be found. Um, the only way to, again, like the only way to get around that is to basically argue that there were hardly any bromeliads there, all right? And because there was hardly any there that existed prior to the flood, that um, there was very few opportunities to preserve them and most of the rock record we'll never see and is eroded away. And so the chances of finding them are very slim. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to listen to that logic, except that the environment that's described by young earth creationists for the pre-flood world would appear to be an environment that's highly conducive to the types of bromeliads we have today in South America, right? That world should have been lush and full of bromeliads. I mean, you got Spanish moss hanging all over the place. You've got uh, all these epiphytic bromeliads that grow up in the the crotches of trees and are hanging down from trees and they're in this that you know a lot of that stuff that if you have ever seen pictures or been to costa rica uh or to in brazil or something like that and gone to the tropical rainforest and you look up and there's just all kinds of other plants growing in the trees a much if not the majority of that are bromeliads right they love that environment wet humid and this is the environment that um, most young earth creationists envision as being the, the, a good portion of the pre-flood world. And so to me, it doesn't make sense to say that bromeliads were extremely scarce and very, very rare pre-flood. Uh, and something about the post-flood world was more conducive to their, their lifestyle. And that's why they have blossomed into the 3,700 species that there are today. Um, that doesn't really, that doesn't really make sense to me uh, to make that particular argument. And the whole single kind versus multiple kind, mm, I don't know. I mean, how, how are you going to choose between those two? Um, it's already hard. I mean, I already, it's already hard to know what a kind is, right? There's no really good definition for it. And then when you go to plants, it's going to get really hard to define kinds. I mean, I, I, as difficult a time as young earth creationists have to pinpointing specific ways to identify kinds, the original kinds, uh, identifying the plants is, is going to be even more difficult. Um, yeah, so let's just wrap it up there and say that uh, bromeliads, plants, um, this isn't the only plant I think we could go through and I could probably pick out another hundred families of plants and show you that they have 
I'll show you a hundred different families of plants that have extremely unique and isolated distributions. Uh, and if plants could survive the floods so much more easily than animals did, plants should have a much more uniform and universal distribution across the earth compared to animals, right? Animals getting off the ark, I understand that the, you know, only a couple, there's only a couple of them. And depending on which way they go, that's where those animals are going to end up and become more common. And maybe other continents just completely miss out on some animals. But plants, right, since there should be hundreds of thousands of representatives of each one of those different families prior to the flood, you would predict that they should be distributed across the earth. You should have the same families, right, maybe different species on different continents because they're going to speciate in different ways in different places. But at least the same family should be represented on different continents. And there are some families that are represented on all continents, like the Asteraceae, the sunflower family, right? But dandelions can send their, their seeds, you know, across continents very easily, all right? So some, some plants have distribution, um, no distribution problems, let's put it that way. Birds and other organisms are constantly transporting plants across continental boundaries. Um, and so some plants find their way very easily. And it's the plants that have those, those distribution mechanisms, all right? They're the ones that are spread more evenly across the earth. Plants that have more difficulty um, uh, moving, all right, are often isolated and located only in, in particular locations. And I get that for, you know, in a young earth creationist model, sure, species are going to be limited to maybe very specific geographical regions and specific habitats. But families shouldn't because most plant families have enough diversity within them that they have adaptations for maybe hot, dry, cold, uh, high elevation, tropical environments. Lots of families have species that have conquered all those different habitats. And yet many families of plants on earth are still only found, even though they had that much genetic variation and genetic uh, variety, right? And capacity, they're still only found on one continent or one area of one continent. That distribution pattern doesn't make sense to me within a young earth creation model. Okay, hey, we gave some plants their, their day. Uh, and again, I'll, I, I will definitely do this about cacti as well, because I think cacti are really cool and, um, they kind of, they do tell the same story, but there's a, a few other interesting, uh, twists to it. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.